Now, there's an old illustration of faith that just doesn't work that well in Bundaberg, but I'm going to go there anyway. But um, the illustration says is that when there is a frozen lake or dam, believe it or not, they can completely freeze over in some places. Um, When there's a frozen lake or dam, you can step onto that ice and potentially fall through if it's thin, or if it's thick enough, you can go ice skating or even drive vehicles on it like they do in some places around the world. The point is, to step onto that ice takes a certain amount of faith. But it's not the amount of faith that decides whether you sink or ice skate. It's the thickness of the ice that actually decides what happens, right? So when you step out, it doesn't matter if you step out gingerly and you're walking really, really hesitantly or you run out onto that thing, it's not the amount of faith that you have that makes the difference, it's just purely whether or not there is thick enough ice to sustain your weight. Saying this, this is why Jesus could say that anyone who has the faith the size of a mustard seed could uproot a mountain and throw it into the sea. Now, mustard seeds were small. They were not strong and impressive. But small faith can achieve great things. Why? Because it's not the size of our faith. It's about whom we have faith in that matters. Right? So it's not really about the size of our faith. It's who we have faith in that matters. Tell me, if you were able to cast a mountain into the sea because of your mustard seed-sized faith, is it your faith that casts the mountain into the sea? No. No, God is the one who actually does the work. You just come with that small amount of faith. And God is the one who makes that occur, okay? So it's our faith in, it's who our faith is in that can achieve great things. Now, I think this was fairly exaggerated speech from Jesus. This was hyperbole. I don't think he literally meant that we would walk around throwing mountains around. Um, Might make farming easier. But um, anyway, I don't think that's really what he meant. What he was saying is, is that when you have your faith in Christ, then it's actually the only limits on what can happen are the limits that God himself has. Right? Right? Because if your faith is in God and he's the one who acts, then the only real limits are the limits that God has. There are not many of those, are there? Right? So this is the whole point of faith. We bring a small amount of faith to God and we don't control God. We don't command God. We can't make him do things. But we come in our small amount of faith and when it accords to God's will, there is no limit to what God is able to achieve. One of the founders of the Open Brethren movement, George Mueller, established many orphanages for which he was famous, and he often found himself simply trusting in God to provide. One morning, when they had hundreds of uh, orphans in this orphanage, um, they probably weren't social distancing, anyway, they had all these orphans in this orphanage, and they had no food at all to feed these children. This is a very well-reported story, and so... They simply gathered at the table and gave thanks for breakfast, which did not exist. Immediately after giving thanks, a baker walked into the shop and said, I just felt the Lord laid upon my heart that I should give bread for all of the children here this morning. A second later, a man walked in from outside who said, I'm the local milk delivery guy. My cart just broke down out the front of your place and I need to get rid of all this milk. Can I just give it to you? Boom, milk and bread, away we go, right? That was how they often operated. A small amount of faith and God is able to do amazing things. We've just finished looking at the story of the woman in the well and the amazing faith of the Samaritan. No miracles, and yet they readily believed in Jesus. 
Now, our story is about to change as Jesus gets to Galilee, his destination before that little interlude with the Samaritan woman. So if you have your Bible there, you can open up to John chapter 4, and we are going to look at verses 46 to 54, and then we're also going to look at the story in John chapter 5, 1 to 18 this morning. So we've got two separate little stories that we're pulling together. So John 4, 46 to 54. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Amen. So Jesus is back where the water into wine miracle occurred, where people are now excited about signs and wonders. So in the midst of of that kind of gathering, we have this official now, This word here is a specific word. It means that he is a servant of royalty. He's a servant of the king, which means that he probably worked for Herod Antipas, who was not actually technically a king, but was popularly considered so. So they often referred to this guy as a king. So in a sense, he's a royal official. Now, this man comes to Jesus, and it's unclear what his understanding of Jesus is. He's clearly understood previously that Jesus is a worker of miracles. He's come across the story of the water into wine. It's unlikely that he thinks Jesus is the Son of God, the Christ. What this man does care about is his dying son. So he comes less in in worship, less in wanting to know who Jesus is, less in wanting to understand the teaching of Christ, and he's more a guy who is desperate for the saving of his son. So Jesus offers a rebuke to him, but also to everyone listening. Now, those of you who have an ESV version, the extra special version of the Bible, uh, like I use, uh, it probably says you, which is not exactly correct. So if you've got an NIV in front of you, it's actually more right, where it says you people. So the word there is kind of actually referring to everyone who is listening. It's referring to the people of Galilee. And Jesus says, you people, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The reality is signs and wonders cannot create true faith. Now they are not wrong. John himself points out that the uh, signs, signs that should point us to Jesus, miracles should reveal and point us to Jesus, but the point is not the signs and wonders themselves. Remember, church, we've talked about this before, but God is the prize. Our salvation is to bring us to God. He is the fulfillment of the longing of our heart. He is the pearl of great price, right? The point is not a miracle. The point is not healing. The point is not a sign. The point is to bring us to God. You are not saved to a prosperous life. You are not saved to a perfect body. You are not saved to wealth. You are saved to God, right? He is the goal. This is why the disciples counted it a joy to suffer 
for Jesus because it brought them closer to the Christ who suffered for them. Right? Count it a joy when we suffer for Christ. Let me pause and make a really strong statement, and I want you to own this because we all move around and we all interact with different places, but if you go to a church that teaches health, wealth, and prosperity, you are not going to a Christian church. You're going to an idol's church where you are the idol and they help you worship. Right? That's the fact. Let me say that again. If you go to a church that teaches health, wealth, and prosperity, you're not going to a Christian church. You're going to an idol's church where you are the idol and they help you worship. That's the point. It's all about you, your prosperity, your wealth, your goodness, your happiness, your fulfillment, whatever it might be, your best life now, all of that rubbish, and it's actually a church that worships you, right? That is not the gospel. Signs and wonders point us to Jesus, and he is the goal and purpose of our faith, not our life, right? His glory. That is the good news. In our passage then, this man doesn't want to debate this point with Jesus, and we get this, his son is dying. So in response to this declaration of Jesus that you guys need signs and wonders to believe, his response is to simply get back to his point, sir, please do something before my child dies. It's a heartfelt prayer, a heartfelt call out to Jesus, please help. And Jesus responds to this simple act of faith. I don't think he really knew who Jesus was, but he cries out and depends on Christ in this moment. And what makes this man so special is that when Jesus says your son will live, he takes Jesus at his word. There's his act of faith. To walk from where they are, from Uh, Cana to Capernaum is about a 40-kilometer walk if you're going via roads. So Jesus is at least 40 k's away from where this son is. But again, as we said, right, our faith is not limited because God is the one whom our faith is in. Does 40 kilometers matter to God? No. So So this guy's a long, long way away. Jesus doesn't need to go there. He doesn't need to lay hands on this guy's son. He doesn't need to be physically present. He just declares that he will be well, and he is. This is why we mustn't slacken for praying in our mission, for praying for our missionaries, etc. Right? It doesn't matter that they're on the other side of the world. We're praying to our God who is just as there as he is here. Keep praying, keep keep seeing what God will do. If you're praying for a miracle on the other side of the planet, believe, trust God. William Carey is known as the father of modern missions, having sort of been credited with starting the major massive mission endeavors of the 19th century. And he had a simple motto, attempt great things for God, expect great things from God. I love it. Attempt great things for God, expect great things from God. Step out in faith. Seek to glorify God. Put him at the center and see what miracles God might do. So the man in our story begins his journey home, trusting what Jesus has said. And on his journey, he comes across servants who are rushing to find him. They discuss it. The son's well. And when they figure it all out, it turns out that he began to get better as soon as Jesus said. And our text says, this man believed him and his whole household. Now, in a sense, there's a slight negative undertone to it. Jesus has said, you guys only believe if you see signs and wonders. What happens right now in our text? There's a sign and a wonder, and then the guy believes. Now, that's not bad. The signs are meant to point us to Jesus. But it is sort of juxtaposed across from the Samaritans, like I said, who believed without a single sign or wonder. Now, we don't know the full story, as I said, of this guy's journey. We know it takes time. For for starters, he has to get home to see his son. We don't know how far that distance is. 
We don't know what more he learned about Jesus, what conversations took place before him and his entire household believed. Right? There's an unfolding of a story here that we're not given all the details. But the point is that we can have faith in Christ, be saved, and we don't need signs and wonders. We can be like the Samaritans, trusting Jesus at his word. Which leads us to the next miracle. This is John 5, 1 to 18, if you have your Bible there. I know I read out some long passages at times, but that's because it's the Word of God, uh, and we should be prepared to listen to what it says. So, John 5, 1 to 18. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these, a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your mat and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So Jesus said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. And it is, oh, so they said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is the man who healed you? And said, take up your bed and walk. Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had helped healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. There is so much in this little passage, so we're only going to be able to pull apart, you know, 10% of it this morning. Uh, but that's why it's great to be involved in a home group because obviously those who are will get to pull apart this a little bit more in depth through the week. So there's my little plug to make sure you join a group. Now, they're in Jerusalem for a feast and John does not tell us what feast it was. Now, rather than speculate, you can read endless commentaries where they all try to put time frames together and come up with the reason this particular feast was happening. The fact that John doesn't tell us which feast it was means that it's probably not important to the text itself. So they were in Jerusalem for a feast, and that's basically all that we need to know. Now, in Jerusalem at the feast, they come to the pool called Bethesda with five roofed colonnades, which people believe may have represented the five books of the Torah, the first five books of your Bible. Multitudes of the lame would congregate there at the Bethesda pool. Now, why? Well, some of you may have a footnote. Uh, Has anyone got this in their Bible? Which says, an angel of the Lord would come and stir the water, and the first one in the water after that would be healed. Has anyone got a footnote about that? Yeah, some people have got that in there. So, that's not biblical. That was the common thought at the time, right? It's, it, it appeared in, I think, one manuscript, this thought, which gives us the history, but it's not biblically what the Bible is saying was occurring. It just tells us the common understood reason that the water would stir is that an angel would come and dip their wings in the water and stir it up, uh, and then the first person into the water after that would be healed. Now, what most scholars actually believe is a couple of things. It was fed by a spring, and our histories tell us that the water was noted to be a red kind of color, 
high in mineral content. And so people believed that it was thought to have medicinal properties, this mineral-rich water, which is probably what sparked this whole kind of idea about the pool. Secondly, it was fed from an underground spring, and people also believed that periodically that spring would cause the water to bubble. Okay? Now, this is the point. There was no set pattern to this. There was no rhyme nor reason to this. Sometimes this kind of red water would bubble when the spring caused it to occur. If you had to be the first person in the water after it bubbled in order to believe you might be healed and you were completely and utterly lame in your legs, it's not like you could just lay in the pool day in, day out, hoping that it would bubble. You can't just become a fish and live there. And so this poor guy, for we don't know how long, but we know he has had no use of his legs for 38 years. For some amount of time, he's been on the edge. Occasionally, the water bubbles. You don't know when it's going to occur. But there's always some people who can get into the water before him. So Jesus comes across this large group of people with disability. And this guy, as I said, has been like this for 38 years. Can you think about that? There were no disability services back then. Things weren't geared up back then for someone who was suffering. For 38 years, this guy has often battled with begging for food, lying in his own filth, This is a hard, hard existence. And Jesus picks out this man. Out of everyone who was there, Jesus picks out one person. Why? We don't know. We don't know. But Jesus picks out somebody, I guess, who has been crippled for 38 years, and clearly it's going to be an act of God to heal him. No one's going to be able to say, well, it was natural regeneration, right? Not after 38 years. So clearly this is a miracle. Jesus picks him out to heal. Now what's so incredible about this passage, and I hope you note this, I talked at the start about faith. How even a small amount of faith can do amazing things because it's who our faith is in that matters. Tell me, church, how much faith does this man have? None. This man doesn't know who Jesus is. This man is not looking for Jesus. This man doesn't have any belief in Jesus. In fact, when Jesus comes to question him, his very answer to Jesus is, yeah, I would like to be healed, but there's no one here to help me into the water. When the waters are stirred, who is his faith in? Or what is his faith in? His faith is in the water in the pool, not in Jesus. Correct? Right? There is no faith from this man whatsoever in Jesus. Don't you love that? Seriously, don't try and put Jesus in a box. Oh, well, for Jesus to act, it means, first of all, we must put our faith and trust in Jesus. Really? What did this guy do, apart from have the completely wrong idea of how he might be healed? Right? Nothing. Some churches today will say that the reason we don't see miracles today like we did back then is we don't have the faith that they had back then. That's just not supported by the New Testament. I've seriously, I've got more faith than this guy. I'll bet that, right? He's got zero. Doesn't even know who Jesus is. God is not constrained by us. He came to seek and save the lost And he does, and often it doesn't look like what we think it should look like. Note what the passage said, at once he was healed, and then he took up his mat and walked. 
At once he was healed. There was no act of obedience or faith from him. He was healed the moment Jesus said it, and then he picked up his mat and walked. He was already healed. Some people have said, oh, he didn't get healed until he picked up his mat. It's not true. Stop trying to put yourself in the story. He was healed, and then he picked up his mat and walked because Jesus told him to. You are healed. Now pick up your mat and walk. Nothing to do with the guy. He's got faith in all the wrong things. And Jesus heals him anyway. Right? Don't think that we can constrain God, that we have him so tightly fitted into a box that he has to act according to us. No, he picks this guy out. He heals this guy. And we see the incredible nature of that in just a little while in our story The uh, Pharisees, Sadducees are going to come up to this guy and have a dead set go at him and he's going to say, yeah, look, I don't even know the name of the guy who healed me, he just did. Doesn't know Jesus from a bar of soap, right? There is no faith. God acts. Now our story is about to take a really, really dramatic shift and this is so significant in our journey through the Gospel of John. We've looked at Jesus explaining to Nicodemus rich, powerful, and educated, how to be saved. We've seen Jesus explaining the way of salvation to the woman at the well, a Samaritan, a despised Samaritan, and showing her the way of salvation through Jesus. Faith in Jesus for all who put their faith in him, regardless of their background. And now our story is going to shift to those who will not be saved. Our story is going to move to those who are opposed to the things of God. We now find out that Jesus healed the man at the pool on the Sabbath and the man walked out according to Jesus' instruction, carrying his mat. The Jews, meaning the Pharisees, Sadducees here, say to the man, it is the Sabbath and it's not lawful for you to carry your mat. Now, this was a rabbinical interpretation of the law. So, Jeremiah 17, 21 to 22, this is what they're they're working from here, says this, Thus says the Lord, take care for the sake of your lives and do not bear a burden on the Sabbath day or bring it by the gates of Jerusalem. And do not carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath or do any work but keep the Sabbath day as holy as I commanded your fathers. Do not bear a burden outside your house. A prohibition about working on the Sabbath and keeping it holy. Now, they had interpreted carrying a burden to 39 different things that that could represent. And one of those things was you could move your bed around inside your house on the Sabbath, but if you carried it outside the doorway on the Sabbath, then that constituted working. And so this guy, by carrying his bedroll outside of his house on the Sabbath, meant that he was breaking the law, according to the Pharisees, who have real have no idea really about the heart of what God's law is all about. But anyway, that's what they are accusing him of. Of course, they accuse this man, and he does the classic, which we all learn to do as children. When you are in trouble, shift the blame as quickly as you can. Why are you carrying your mat on the Sabbath? The guy who healed me told me to. That's his answer. Read it in the text. The guy who healed me told me to. It's not my fault. Anyone ever had their child say that to them? You know, oh, it was so-and-so. The yeah, problem is, has anyone else done that as an adult? Yeah, that's, that's another problem, isn't it? But anyway, he follows that well-trodden path. The man who told me made me take up my mat and walk. He doesn't even know who Jesus is. Now, that could have ended the story right there. But interestingly, Jesus now goes and finds this guy in the temple and has a further conversation with him. So Jesus now tracks him down and reinitiates this whole thing. And Jesus Jesus drops a comment here, which is huge, which we could unpack in an entire sermon on its own. See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. 
Ah, dropping a bomb. Nice little can of worms here, right? Now, throughout the Scriptures, again, we can't put God in a box. In 1 Corinthians 11, people are getting sick and some are dying because of sin. So we cannot say emphatically that sinning can't cause ill health because we see it spelled out for us in 1 Corinthians 11. However, later on in John, we're going to have a man who was born blind and people are going to say to Jesus, whose sin was it that caused this guy to be blind? And Jesus is going to say, it was no one's sin, this was done that God may be glorified. So, can sin cause illness? Yes. Does it necessarily cause illness? Well, no. Illness can be for a whole other purpose. So, we can't actually boil that down. The reality is, and I don't have time today for us to unpack this, sin can cause sickness according to the Scriptures. Is sickness necessarily a result of sin? No, according to the Scriptures. All right? So this, it's a big topic that we could look at another time. But what I want to say is this. Jesus says, sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. There's a couple other ways we can look at that as well. We know for a fact sin, according to the ways of the world that God created, sin can automatically have bad consequences. Drink enough alcohol and you will destroy your liver. Smoke enough cigarettes and you will destroy your lungs, amongst other things. Sexual addiction leads to STDs. Anger and stroke, uh, anger and stress might lead to a stroke. The point is, living in sin can have consequences. This guy was healed of uh, whatever injury he'd sustained, but if he lives a life of sin, chances are that will lead to further ill effects on the body. Correct? Right? All of these things that we live in sin can have consequences for us. Of course, the even deeper point, I think, of Jesus' words might be that if he continues in sin and not in faith in Jesus, then something worse will happen to him. He will remain under the wrath of God for sin, and he will spend eternity in hell, which is definitely worse than 38 years of disability. But this is the true warning for all of us, isn't it? Our choice to reject Jesus for a life of sin is not a choice like some people think between floating around on a cloud playing a harp versus being in hell and partying with my mates like some people have said to me. Now that's not the choice. The choice is being with God and the things of God. His glory, His joy, His love, His compassion. His kindness, or hell where the things of God do not exist, where there is only regret, sorrow, anger, and pain. But that's the choice. Now, clearly in this conversation, This man gets to meet Jesus. And for some reason, he now goes and tells the Jews that it was Jesus who healed him. So when he figures out who Jesus is, he goes and makes sure that the authorities know that it was Jesus. And now we get a glimpse of the people who won't be saved. The religious These are the people who are less concerned about a man walking after 38 years of being paralyzed than by whether or not carrying a mat after that miracle constitutes work. But that's what they're worried about. Is carrying a mat constituting work and ignoring the fact that this miracle has occurred which can only be by the hand of God. Religion can keep you from God. Religion is the practice of rules to try and bring you to a God who can only be reached by faith. Right? Religion is the practice of rules to bring you to a God who can only be reached by faith in His Son. 
sometimes the rules stand in place of the faith and stop you from ever coming to salvation. You see, things are about to change now. From the religious leader's view, wondering if Jesus was a prophet, wondering if Jesus was from God, wondering if he was going to uh, perform miracles in the name of God, now they are going to make up their mind about Jesus. And from here on in, this is the turning point in the Gospel of John, from now on the religious leaders are against Jesus. Because he was doing uh, healing on the Sabbath, and an even bigger point. Now, let me give you a little uh, example of when religion can take the place of faith, just really quickly. It sort of fits and it sort of doesn't. I'll explain that. I was at a Mount Tambourine East Convention years ago and the speaker preached a message where, you know, sometimes a preacher stands up and they preach and it's fine and you can sit there and go, yeah, I heard the word of God, but sometimes the spirit comes in power and you just feel God's presence in the room and it was one of those occasions. This preacher preached, and at the end of the sermon, he said, right, I'm now asking all of you to spend 15 minutes in quiet prayer where you are. That's a bold call, isn't it? Like some people are like 10 minutes into a sermon, they're like, is it over yet? And this guy at the end of a 45-minute sermon said, we're now going to spend 15 minutes in quiet prayer. And I tell you what, no one moved. All you could hear in the silence was gentle weeping praying, because the presence of God was there, until someone in the running committee looked at their watch and said, okay, it's time for us to try and sell the old auditorium organ, and after one minute, 30 of prayer, stood up, got the microphone, and said, rightio, we have the old organ in the uh, auditorium up here that needs to be sold, so if anyone would like to come and buy, and in a second, that feeling of the presence of God was gone because someone was more concerned about a run sheet than feeling the Spirit of God moving, right? Now, this wasn't a set of religious laws that were being followed, but it's someone who's so caught up in the routine that they've lost the passion. They've lost the ability to feel the Spirit of God, to worship in spirit and truth, right? They long instead of longing for the presence of God and feeling it when it comes, they're just caught up in the practical reality. Rules and regulations can create a dryness for God and it removes the heart for Him. Obey the the Word, yes, it's the truth of God, but obey the Word in spirit, in passion, for it should bring us to Jesus. Right? Avoid stale religion. So when Jesus was questioned, he answered them, my father is working until now and I am working. What's Jesus' point? That God the Father is always working and in the context of our passage, God the Father doesn't have the Sabbath off. If he holds all things together by the power of his word, that means he's even working on the Sabbath, does it not? Believe it or not, the Jews had thought about this. The Pharisees had actually thought this through. Is God the Father, is he breaking his own rules and sinning by working on the Sabbath? Was a question they had wrestled with. But their answer was this, and I love it. You can actually read this written down in their recorded writings. The entire world is God's home. Therefore, he never carries his mat outside the door. Right? So he, he's working, but he's working inside his home. Therefore, he's not sitting on the Sabbath. Right? We've got that sorted. No, you don't. Oh, my goodness. Right? Talk about missing the point. But that's what they would come up with. So Jesus says... My Father is always working, and so am I. In other words, God the Father works on the Sabbath, holding the world together, doing good. And I, God's Son, am working on the Sabbath, doing good, healing someone who was crippled for 38 years. 
I and the Father are one, he is essentially saying. And the Jews got it. The firstborn son inherited. The firstborn son carried on the family traditions. The firstborn son was equal to the father. And Jesus says, just like the father, I'm working on the Sabbath. And just like the father, he and I are one. Well, that's a little bit of a problem, isn't it, for the Jewish understanding of things. Jesus makes himself equal with God. Jesus has now just blasphemed to the highest order in the eyes of the Jewish people. In their zeal to stop God, God's name being blasphemed, they're not going to be able to see the Son of God when he came. In their religious zeal to stop God's name being blasphemed, They miss the Son of God when he comes. From a message of salvation to the rich and to the poor, from a man who had faith to accept Jesus could heal from a long way away, to a man who showed no faith at all, Jesus is in control over his creation and offering salvation to all who repent and believe in him. But to those who don't, They would rather see him dead than bend their knees in submission to his lordship. Church, that's the wrestle for all of us, to put your faith in Christ, bend your knee, accept him as Lord, or reject him entirely, and the hell will come your way that comes with that. But that is what this message is showing us. We now have those who accept Jesus, and those who will fight Jesus, and it is the same for each and every one of us. That is the choice the Lord puts before us this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the love of God that we see when Jesus shares his Uh, the message of salvation, of being born again to Nicodemus, the teacher of teachers. Lord, when we see him explain to a Samaritan woman how she can be saved and, and how many in Samaria believe. Lord, how we see him rebuke those who need a sign and a wonder to believe and yet he still offers salvation to those who need it. Lord, to him picking someone who has no faith at all and healing him. Lord, we thank you for the love of God that redeems all kinds of people. And yet, Lord, at the same hand, we see those who would rather seek to kill God's Son than bend their knee in worship. Lord, the reality is that's the choice for everyone today. They either accept who you are, put their faith in you, or they reject you and your offer of salvation, and the Father's wrath will be poured out upon them. But we pray, we pray that everyone here this morning would give their life to Jesus, would repent and believe. We pray, Lord, that you would use us to speak your message of salvation in this community. Lord, that we would see people saved from eternal damnation. But we pray that we would willingly worship Christ as the Son of God and lift him up for his glory's sake. In your name we pray. Amen.